Good evening, everyone. I am Hamsa Kunyu. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you all for today's talk, uh, Luca Talk on Climate Change. So our focus today is on the recent uh, COP28 and its impact on India, uh, a topic that's both timely and uh, crucial. So it's a great privilege to have Professor T. J. Raman with us as our uh, esteemed speaker. His uh, unparalleled expertise in this field makes him an ideal guide for today's discussion. Welcome, Professor J. Raman. So uh, Thank you. I hope many of you remember the climate change course Luca did a while back. We also had a mock COP exercise during the concluding climate camp uh, organized at Cochin University. In fact, uh, that mock COP session filled with uh, intense debates and questions some of which remained unanswered. Uh, this sets a perfect stage for our discussion today. I bet a lot of you have been keeping up with uh, what happened at COP28. Today, uh, we hope to clear up uh, some of the things we talked about during our mock COP session and the uh, heated discussion afterwards in our WhatsApp group. So as you are all aware, uh, COP28 uh, has been one of the most controversial conferences in the recent times especially with the uh, widespread skepticism about its effectiveness. Uh, key issues such as the uh, lack of uh, definitive plan to phase out fossil fuels and the uh, inadequacy of financial commitments for the addressing loss and damage fund. These were notable uh, disappointments during this uh, uh, conference. However, uh, there were also significant positive steps, including the operationalization of the loss and damage fund and the uh, agreement to significantly boost uh, renewable energy capacity. Anyhow, today, uh, Professor Jer Jeraman is going to give us insight into what we what went well and what did it at COP28, with a special focus on how it affects India and other developing countries. Now, uh, let me formally introduce Professor Jeraman, although he is someone who hardly needs an introduction. Professor Jairaman is a senior fellow at the MS Swaminathan Research Foundation. He has a rich uh, uh, academic history that began with a PhD in theoretical physics from University of Madras. His career spans important roles at the Institute of Mathematical Sciences, Chennai, and a shift to interdisciplinary research at the Data Institute of Fundamental Research and the Data Institute of Social Sciences in Mumbai. His work now encompasses a broad range of issues from climate change policy to the societal impact of science and technology. And it makes him a respected voice in discussions on uh, global climate challenges. Above all, uh, the fact that Professor Jairaman was part of the official Indian delegations for COP uh, 26, 27, and 28, if I remember correctly, he was serving as a technical expert, uh, which highlight his significant uh, role in today's dialogue. We are indeed uh, fortunate to have the opportunity to, opportunity to hear his valuable insights today. Now, uh, about the format for today's talk, uh, we have set aside around uh, one to one hour and 15 minutes for the lecture. And then we will have a 30 minute session for the question and answers. Please feel free to write your questions in the chat box, uh, preferably in English. If you are more comfortable with Malayalam, uh, please write in Malayalam. We will happily translate your questions for the speaker. And if time permits, uh, we might also be able to take a few live questions. So with great anticipation, let's welcome Professor Jairaman to enlighten us. Professor Jairaman, please take the floor. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Uh, Hamza Kunu. And uh, uh, you said great expectations, so I hope I don't disappoint my uh, audience. Uh, I will, uh, since uh, given the introduction that you gave, I will assume uh, that uh, there is a basic familiarity that a large number of you would have with uh, uh, what is happening in uh, uh, conference of parties which is what cop stands for of the unfcc and uh, that uh, some very elementary details uh, i need not uh, explain and i can skip them 
and uh, i will take it to that i am speaking to a reasonably uh, oriented uh, audience so with that uh, i think uh, i on no account intend to speak for an hour and 15 minutes and 550 50, 50 minutes is my target hopefully something around that so that uh, we have some time for uh, questions which i'm sure will be uh, interesting for me in person as well okay so here goes let me begin by sharing my powerpoint so at the uh, outset let me uh, point out uh, something that uh, the moderator referred to to what extent does uh, uh, you know should we take a cop seriously a conference of parties so there is always this uh, debate which takes place around uh, every conference of parties every un climate summit as they are sometimes called and uh, about its effectiveness and in fact this uh, there is a sort of if you wish both on the side of climate activists those who are very concerned or those who are uh, not very concerned about climate who regard that as a waste of time and uh, so the skeptics and the deniers etc on across from both extremes and uh, even others in the middle there is a general reluctance to think of uh, a general uh, concern about the utility of these conference of parties now the first point i want to emphasize is that we have no choice so is the are the conference of parties effective that is indeed debatable do they achieve what they set out to uh, sort of uh, set themselves as the agenda not always are their outcomes as uh, meaningful or as uh, effective in dealing with the problem of uh, global warming as we would like the answer certainly very often is no but nevertheless i wish to emphasize two things one is that the problem of coming to agreement at the cop is not a manufactured one it is not as if people debate for the just the sake of debating it is reflects a genuine difficulty to come to agreement on issues that are deeply divisive for a number of reasons so i won't elaborate those but you must recognize the deeply contested nature of the uh, issues that we are uh, facing and so the friction that you see in coming to agreement is a friction that is present in a real world is not a manufactured one the second point i wish to make is that there is no option to having the conference of parties so what is the alternative you won't have one at all or even worse would you allow a small coterie of countries to decide what others should do you know there are people who talk of climate clubs etc meaning a group of countries who agree to do something but on the other hand climate change is a global collective action problem so you do need everybody in it and of course they say well you know you have 20 of the biggest emitters you you cover 80% of all emissions well maybe but nevertheless uh, this is a problem that involves everybody in some form or the other perhaps not as the perpetrators of damages perhaps as those who suffer the consequences of global warming in whatever fashion there is no way a minority can dictate to the world so you need everybody there and there is therefore no alternative 
to the process of meeting to discuss the issue. And that is precisely what the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change represents. The UNFCC is both the uh, name given to the agreement itself and the organization, the UN uh, institution that uh, administers uh, the implementation of the Framework Convention and the Conference of Parties is its highest make decision making body. So there is, I would emphasize, no alternative to it. And as I like to point out, uh, you know, we have Ukraine in front of us, we have Gaza in front of us, we have all kinds of other conflicts around the world in which uh, different countries are complicit. But uh, nevertheless, uh, can we say that has the UN succeeded in dealing with all of them? The answer is no. But at the same time, does that mean we can do without the United Nations? That I think would be a very problematic conclusion. So with this as introduction, let me move on to the issue of COP28 itself. So all uh, uh, the conference of parties, since it is the ultimate decision making body uh, of uh, implementing the UNFCC, that treaty. So all uh, conference of parties have a formal agenda. So the formal agenda of COP28 was first of all the global stock take. The global stock take is a process and uh, somewhat uh, unhappy name, uh, an Americanism, if you wish. Uh, and so the global stock take is a review process extended over two years, which reviews the implementation of the Paris Agreement. And this was part, it is built in as part of the mechanism of the Paris Agreement. The second, and this of course was a major landmark and perhaps the single most important issue at COP28. The second was adopting a framework for the global goal on adaptation. The global goal on adaptation is part of the Paris Agreement. And so the goal itself is very simply stated. It is about uh, addressing vulnerabilities and increasing resilience across the globe. However, uh, operationalizing it and implementing it is a different matter. So two years of discussion had led to an agreement that we must have a framework. So adopting this framework was a major uh, agenda item. Then the third was finalizing a work program on just transition. And uh, this uh, work program uh, came to a conclusion. Just transition, uh, I will come to a uh, little later what exactly it means. There's some clarification required. Then, of course, the uh, moderate success with the loss and damage fund, which was not, of course, anticipated. Uh, prior to COP itself, continuing negotiations on the uh, tortuous issue of climate finance and the larger issue of what is called the means of implementation that developed countries are supposed to give developing countries under the UNFCC and the Paris Agreement, which is uh, refers to finance technology transfer and capacity building. And last but not least, there were negotiations on Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, meaning the different forms of carbon trading that were envisaged in the Paris Agreement. So this was the formal agenda. Of course, you know, the every country that hosts a COP seeks to leave its uh, imprint on the uh, process. And so the formal agenda uh, is, seems, uh, is somewhat more uh, general and perhaps even one may say a little bland, not very revealing. But then there are, so what do you want to achieve? So typically for every COP, there is something of a 
uh, goals, a set of goals and objectives which the presidency of the COP tries to set. Now, it depends whether the other parties agree with them, what determines these goals. But first, let us look at what they were for the COP28. So the first was, uh, and this was announced by Sultan al Jabbar, the president of uh, COP28, uh, for, uh, for uh, what he called the four paradigm shifts. As an aside, I must say that I am not very sympathetic to these arguments uh, which went around uh, labeling the, uh, you know, Sultan al Jabbar as uh, a COP president who owns an oil company. So, how would you trust him? There is nothing in that sense uh, you know, personal about a COP uh, presidency. Uh, the president of the COP as a person functions under the authority bestowed on him by his government. And if we are talking about the head of uh, a petro state, then of course uh, Joe Biden happens to be the foremost head of a petro state. And the foremost petro state in the world is perhaps the United States of America. So I think that whole argument was uh, much of a red herring. So, what was the agenda that he repeatedly set out in letters? He was a very communicative uh, COP president. So the first was what he called fast tracking the energy transition and slashing emissions before 2030. The popular language uh, popularized by Britain in COP26 was keeping 1.5 degree goal alive meaning the goal of keeping temperature increase above pre-industrial levels to 1.5 uh, degrees. Uh, so the other was a rapid uh, emission reduction, including global peaking by 2025, and 43% of reduction of emissions below 2020 levels by 2030, and what he called just orderly and equitable energy transition. So here is the word transition again. So energy transition refers to transitioning away from, uh, the, from the use of fossil fuels and dependence on fossil fuels to a renewable energy and a sustainable energy uh, use. Now, of course, uh, just uh, to keep in mind that energy here refers to energy in a general sense. Uh, so what later uh, I will talk about what came up uh, as uh, was called energy systems in the COP28 decision. So this is energy does not mean simply power or electricity generation. So energy transition. The second, of course, he obviously couldn't avoid uh, what he called delivering on old promises and setting the framework for a new deal on finance. The uh, 100 billion per annum of climate finance promised by the uh, developed countries at Copenhagen, mind you, which was 2009, 14 years ago. Uh, and that uh, has not come to pass by 2020. There is even a dispute on what is the correct uh, scale of uh, uh, finance. And in fact, even the definition of what counts for climate finance is a separate subject of discussion at the COP. The other thing is a persistent demand for doubling adaptation finance. Uh, important but uh, woefully inadequate, but nevertheless uh, a first step forward. And the third was to go beyond this USD 100 billion per annum by 2020 to what is called a, to a new goal of collective uh, quantified goal, as it is called, on climate finance to set a new target. The uh, other, uh, the, the third paradigm shift, as he put it, was to put what he called uh, nature, people, and lives and livelihoods at the heart of climate action. 
way it was to one was of course the framework of the global goal on adaptation the second was put in place the loss and damage fund on which case uh, on which he achieved a spectacular uh, success by having it uh, ready to be announced uh, the formation of the fund and the inauguration of the cop itself that was something of a procedural coup and i think we should not grudge in the uh, celebration of the fact but whether that uh, fund in its current form will answer uh, its expectations is a very debatable question it does not say who will provide the monies it provides the it puts the administration uh, of the fund uh, in the hands of the world bank and on both these counts what's the future hold we will have to wait and see the other thing that uh, uh, he uh, the cop 28 presidency wanted was to have a series of declarations at every cop you have these declarations that are not part of the main negotiations but uh, were stronger statements than something that everybody agrees to can be made so he wanted one on there was one on food systems and agriculture there was another on climate and health there uh, and these were two he had promised there was also uh, there was one on tripling renewable energy uh, so we will come to those but uh, several of these india did not sign and for reasons uh, that i will just uh, come to so the fourth of course he promised an inclusive cop but that's more a, a procedural issue uh, however it is one thing to have these agendas which are publicly declared but as always we know that countries have the political have their own political agenda at an international conference of this kind and these are long term agendas that are set by whoever is the has the upper hand in the global political scene so while the developing countries have the benefit of numbers a loud enough voice if they choose to but the developing developed countries uh, many ways hold the upper hand because they uh, to put it in uh, very simple and stark terms uh, they have the upper hand in a very unequal world and this uh, inequalities are uh, economic uh, they are uh, inequalities in trade it is inequalities in the level of well being of uh, uh, their people and fine last but not least they are political inequalities inequalities of power so the developed countries agenda has a very important role in shaping the uh, paris agreement and of course the long term agenda of the developed countries is that uh, every agreement is a step forward in extracting more from the large developing countries or so they say meaning mainly uh, targeting china and india and to a lesser extent brazil and south africa but in reality it is really getting the maximum out of the major part of the world allowing the rich countries which are basically the oecd countries joined of course in these matters joined by uh, russia and uh, some of its uh, uh, countries close to it a few of them from the ex soviet bloc so the agenda here is to smooth them their own transition to sustainability and uh, uh sustainable energy world but uh, you know fossil free world but uh, they don't quite deny its uh, necessity but the idea is to make their transition as smooth as painless and as comfortable as possible by the rest of us are to have a hard landing 
So how do they do this? And one of this is, of course, constantly revise and reformulate the notion of equity, dilute the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. See, common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities is not simply a bunch of words. Huh? There are uh, climate activists in India who are prone to make fun of this. And I think it is highly misplaced. First of all, these are terms that are very important in international law. So if you sign a contract for, you know, for buying a house or something, and uh, if uh, you are looking through it very carefully to see whether the terms and conditions, etc., are legally correct and your friend uh, uh, comes and says, oh, forget it, it's all a piece of paper, these words don't matter. So that is very poor advice. For the same reason, I would say, you know, poo-pooing the idea of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities in the light of national circumstances, as the full phrasing goes in the Paris Agreement, this is a term of art in international law. And uh, if you wait uh, and watch for a while, you will see in the year to come, when the International Court of Justice uh, considers the climate uh, issue, uh, then, of course, uh, you know, you will, uh, I'm sure the significance of these terms will become emphasized much more in the public domain. So, so, but diluting this is the agenda of the developed countries. The other point that they have uh, is that everything must be uh, subservient to keeping 1.5 degree alive, meaning the possibility of uh, curtailing temperature increase to 1.5 within reach. As I will just argue shortly, this is not going to happen. So this is actually a code word for uh, saying that everybody must do mitigation, whether their uh, uh, per capita annual uh, power consumption is, uh, even if it is less than that of an American refrigerator, which is true of several countries in Africa, even then you are supposed to do mitigation. So this is what they mean by keeping 1.5 alive. There should be no reference to responsibility. Now, this is, uh, you know, the one of the problems of the Paris Agreement is that it has no legally binding commitment on developed countries. That was the original intention at Durban in 2011. It never came to pass because Obama couldn't pass it through his Senate. So the Paris Agreement is all an agreement about process. And so you can make your own contribution. But uh, nevertheless, everybody realizes, and it is there in the convention, the phrasing is very clear, their Paris Agreement also, there is the question of responsibility. And responsibility is also a scientific question. The Paris Agreement begins implementation in 2020. So I, by 2020, the Earth has already warmed by 1.1 degrees. So you can't pretend that, you know, forget about it. That's not important. That's not relevant. You have to first ask the question, how did we get here? Is the most obvious scientific question. And that is the question of responsibility. So they want no reference to unmet obligations of developed countries. And uh, uh, they want to uh, impose a mitigation on all critical sectors which affects the major part of the world's population. I must just remind you that, you know, uh, the bottom 50% of all emitters emit only 13 to 15% of annual global emissions, and the vast majority of them earn less than 3 US dollars purchasing power parity per capita per day. So I think, uh, uh, so to uh, demand 
Okay, there is a open mic somewhere. If somebody, if you could ask them to turn it off. So asking, therefore, demanding mitigation in areas such as forests, in agriculture, health, etc., is uh, you know unconscionable in a world uh, which is in this state. The other thing is uh, developed countries are forcing. Uh, mitigation on developing countries by insisting that developing uh, uh, countries should pay a border tax if their emissions are not compatible with European Union norms. This is what the European Union is saying. It's called the cross-border adjustment mechanism, which is just uh, forcing mitigation on us by saying otherwise we'll stop your exports or we'll put a tariff on them which means of course that you will have to pay for your carbon emissions which is like carbon taxing the uh, the rich carbon taxing the poor for instance you know entire south asia has contributed only 4% of uh, global cumulative emission from 1850 to 2019 so, you know, and that is uh, virtually 24% of the global population, South Asia. So, you know, when the European Union says that it will put CBAM on South Asian uh, uh, imports, that's uh, really the rich uh, taxing the poor. The other final thing, of course, is climate finance. They constantly insist that it will not be public sourced, it will not be concessional, it has to be given through private sector. And that, of course, means heralding a new era of debt, which will be so-called a green debt rather than whatever colored debt was earlier. So this, uh, of course, is the political agenda. It is not as if developing countries are not aware of this, but this is the context in which COP28 or all uh, conference of parties for the last 15 years have become very contested. So India started off, of course, uh, whatever uh, political differences at home, there is a fair degree of uh, agreement as a political consensus on India's position in uh, global uh, uh, climate arena. And in fact, the PM statement uh, inaugurating the high level segment of COP28 uh, was unexceptionable in this regard. Uh, very importantly, he called for the fair share of uh, to all developing countries in the global carbon budget is a very important uh, statement. And it is the first time that India has said it at a COP uh, very clearly and from the highest level, though it is also part of our uh, submission to the UNFCC on our long-term mitigation strategy. He called for maintaining a balance between uh, adaptation, mitigation, climate finance, technology, and loss and damage. This is one of the hallmarks of India's position a balanced approach. And I think uh, this is a genuine, uh, I think, uh, a conceptual contribution that India has always made to the climate debate. A third is that uh, uh, energy transition that should be just inclusive and uh, equitable. Orderly, of course, uh, you know, is a concession to the rich countries. Uh, continuous development of innovative technology that I think is very important. And in fact, uh, uh, he also mentioned transfer of technology to other countries. And he emphasized, uh, in fact, used the word without selfishness. And that is, I think, a very important, pithy characterization of uh, uh not putting ipr restrictions on green technology this is something india argued for during covid as well so perhaps not with very limited success and strengthening the clean energy supply chain 
India traditionally, and this continues, has always had a clear signal of its emphasis on equity. And the other thing is, we will not allow adaptation to be confused with uh, mitigation. So the declarations on agriculture and food system, the declaration on health and health systems, and the uh, both these declarations had the, the use of the term systems meant that you looked at the entire supply chain. And when you look at the entire supply chain, then it becomes that Walmart and Monsanto are equal to the you know, small farmer, they are all on par. So mitigation is everybody's responsibility. There are uh, misguided uh, statements of how much food systems contribute to uh, emissions which follow as a result. So India very firmly said that they would not sign. So India did not sign it. Similarly, health system spoke of decarbonizing the health chain in a situation where hunger is rising, where the number of people at risk of malnutrition is after years of decline post pandemic has been rising and where you have a situation where health still remains uh, out of reach of uh, a couple of billion across the globe. To put mitigation and conflate with it adaptation is unacceptable. This was a very clear message. And uh, even on tripling renewable energy, they introduced uh, the phase out of coal also as an attached requirement. So India did not sign it. So the uh, to turn now to the outcomes, this is the sort of uh, framework or the background in which uh, COP28 uh, began. So the what are the landmarks of the outcome? Now, I won't go into the process. Uh, perhaps there is some other occasion where we should really discuss seriously the process of how the conference of parties take place. This is important as a political issue. But today, uh, that's not my focus, and the focus is on the outcomes. The first, of course, was the decision on the global stock take. Now, the global stock take, since it reviewed the Paris Agreement and given the insistence of the developed countries who were trying to rewrite the goals of the Paris Agreement itself, reframe the agreement, so to speak, uh, this decision. Uh, was very important. And the second thing is, was very comprehensive because it just covered everything else. So it's a, some 25 or 28 page monster of a, a document uh, by the standards of such international meetings. And uh, so it states very clearly that the Paris Agreement is not standalone, that it is a creature of the UNFCC, uh, this is not semantics, is a very important point to make, but this has been retained. The strong references to equity, common but differentiated responsibility and respective capabilities were retained. All attempts, in fact, you know, at one point in the discussion, they sought to erase uh, all reference to responsibility. In, even in fact of our responsibility. So, you know, uh, developing countries told developed countries that you are being a bit over the top on this, you know. In order to safeguard your uh, own interests, you are sacrificing the global interests. So, uh, responsibility, the reference has been retained. The failure of developed countries to achieve what they should by 2020 has been very clearly stated. Then uh, in mitigation, a very important issue that the substantial depletion of the global carbon budget has been noted uh, that four fifths of the carbon budget for 1.5 degree uh, warming is uh, already gone. 
this provides some context much needed context to the uh, issue of uh, uh, keeping 1.5 alive uh, there was uh, of course a lot of emphasis predictably on uh, quote unquote nature based solutions which is basically having emitted whatever they have they expect the forests of the global south to be the dustbins of the carbon of the global north that's exactly what it is and of course a very key reference to developed countries taking the lead in climate action was retained in the final uh, decision so these are not uh, verbal victories though of course implementing them is difficult they have meaning in uh, the kind of politically contested uh, world we live in so uh, to go to what were the some of the most crucial aspects of the gst decision and as many of you know from the media the emission reduction targets were the subject of uh, much uh, debate so it says uh, it recognizes that the uh, limit on the uh, about when peaking should occur and also the reduction in greenhouse gases is based on modeling and assumptions so this is a weak version of a much stronger story which otherwise many developing countries have now started uh, uh, articulating and i will just explain it in just a couple of minutes and uh, then of course uh, uh, there is a caveat saying developing countries uh, will peak later so if peaking has to take place by 2025 developed the countries have to cut their emissions sufficiently to allow developing countries to peak later otherwise you can't have a global peak by 2025 somebody has to do more if uh, developing countries have to have some headroom so these are three key decisions so uh let me very quickly talk about why this global model the pathways and assumptions is very important uh among the several others my colleagues and myself uh dr kanit term my colleague akhil maitri who is on this call i believe and uh, myself we examined all the scenarios which for emission reduction which the ipcc has assessed and look that uh, the uh, you know uh, what this 43% means see this 43% is actually a some a sort of average over all the scenarios what they predict we must do by 2030 in order to keep below 1.5 degrees but however what we found was that these are tremendously uh, inequitable scenarios we'll come to that and here of course is the famous paragraph para 28 over which there was substantial uh, debate this was uh, something of a uh, tussle that finally landed on this language uh, you will see that the opening uh, five lines which is a sort of introduction to the bulleted uh, uh, numbered uh, uh, list below uh, uh, this is sometimes called a chapeau a french word meaning a cap okay which means the starting part of the text uh, and then the details follow so the chapeau says uh, emphasizes one that uh, parties to contribute calls upon it's uh, sort of not a uh, demand and it is not something which is uh, can be insisted upon uh, in a nationally determined manner taking into account the paris agreement is uh, basically saying that 
everything in the Paris Agreement counts, including equity and common but differentiated responsibilities and different national circumstances, pathways and approaches. In fact, in some of these, even more than uh, India, uh, Africa was, you know, uh, in the lead compared to the like-minded developing countries, which is the coalition of countries that India belongs to, which has a very strong position on equity and differentiation. African uh, Union, the Africa group of negotiators, was also very insistent on some of these. So here, of course, uh, you have these, uh, the tripling of renewable energy capacity, phase down of unabated coal power. Actually, uh, it was also, there were uh, wording which suggested no further uh, unabated coal power that uh, did not finally come about. Uh, this is, of course, uh, a problematic sentence, accelerating efforts globally towards net zero emission energy systems. Now, energy systems is a fuzzy word and basically means anything that needs energy. So it is not simply power or uh, electricity it is everything so it is uh, total mitigation uh, utilizing zero and low carbon fuels that's a, a problematic statement if you have a low carbon fuel how low is low and how much eventually will it emit so if you still want net zero it has to be absorbed by forestation basically because what else is there so who is going to do it yes okay so this is a problematic statement but nevertheless uh, weak enough to uh, perhaps live with it the again uh, transitioning away from fossil fuels in energy system in a just orderly and equitable manner so as to again achieve net zero by 2050. So this again is an issue, but just and the equitable, I think provides some uh, cushion for developing countries. And uh, so let us try to deconstruct this a little bit. And then of course there were uh, references to hydrogen, etc. Uh, ritual reference to methane, which of course uh, we could not have left Dubai uh, without this because the US would never agree. Uh, then, of course, uh, uh, for the first time, a spectral uh, uh, sort of uh, target is brought on board by referring to particularly road transport and even there. Uh, a uh, particular reference to zero and low emission vehicles. There are a variety of other aspects of road transport which are relevant uh, and so on. So then, of course, they keep uh, hammering away at fossil fuel subsidies. But the reality is that all developing countries will take recourse to subsidies as long as they have a population that needs it. And this is simply a fact of life. So let us try and deconstruct this a little uh, in detail. What is the, why did I make all these remarks that I have been making on these global targets? So what is the story so the main point of course is developed countries have by their simply profligate emissions you know the united states uh, accounts for almost 25 percent of global cumulative emission though so it constitutes or was it 20 percent we uh, check the numbers uh, you can look it up on our climate equity monitor. Uh, will somebody, uh, Gautam, if you're there, you can put this in the chat. The numbers are there for you to see. So having consumed the carbon budget, now the rest of the carbon budget, what little remains. So one fifth of the carbon budget is what is needed for development of 80% of the world. 
and you know that is something they are still want a lion share of where and so uh, they want to impose a series of global targets which means uh, in effect they will try to make it targets for all countries and therefore try to uh, you know make their uh, path smoother now of course this is uh, not a win win but a lose lose for the world because uh, when you have such uh, enormous uh, uh, you know when you take uh, what i refer to the bottom 50% of the world world emitters who earn less than 3 us dollars per capita per day then you know it is like trying to squeeze uh, water out of stone this is not going to happen so this is not a good way to do mitigation but still this is their ideology so for this uh, point i have already made look at the numbers uh the non annex one uh, the annex one countries which uh, uh population is 19% they have till 2019 consumed 68% of the global carbon budget so what is left only uh one fifth of the budget is left and of course you know the whatever little reduction you see is actually a consequence of the russia and the ex soviet bloc countries their economic uh, downturn after they gave up the socialist model so that uh, a huge shrinking of their productive capacity reduced their emissions that is why developed countries uh, emissions have uh, seem to have reduced their share but if you look at the oecd countries the west uh, quote and quote then uh, you know there is very little reductions that have uh, happened okay so that is what is referred to by the term non eit annex 1 that it means the oecd countries so what is this 43% why does it come from where does it come from 43% is the median value based on global model pathways assessed by the ipcc and as i pointed out to you uh, already mentioned earlier we have done a close analysis of these scenarios and you find that, that these uh, perpetuate and accentuate inequality of all kinds into the future and this is the basis on which they project how emissions reduction will take place so for instance these models uh, these are all basically modeled the pathways of the future so they project that uh, 80% uh, uh of uh, emissions reduction in sub saharan africa in this decade compared to 50% in north america and europe and this mind you when as i pointed out to you there are seven or eight african countries whose annual per capita energy consumption is less than that of a annual energy consumption of an american refrigerator in all these scenarios it is assumed that income consumption and energy use in most developing world will remain well below the norm uh, a kind of permanent inequality because that is the only way that uh, the major part of the carbon budget can be denied or to put it in other term the the developed countries can have a smooth and gradual path to emissions reduction in fact most strikingly in all these uh, uh, scenarios food security is severely compromised there's something that nobody talks about in fact the number of people at risk of hunger would increase there is a massive rise in poverty levels this is available in the literature and this is the uh, scen these are the scenarios which uh, they are uh, uh, unfortunately has keeps finding mention it was mentioned in cop 26 in cop 27 in cop 28 
at least we managed to insert that caveat about there being global model the pathways and the assumptions. Uh, so developing countries are now very vocal, of course, on this issue. Are alternate scenarios possible? Yes. So if the first uh, uh, column you see, the first uh, graph on the left is what the IPCC is projecting, which shows that the global reduction of 45% by 2030 is uh, going to be actually by a reduction of 43% uh, by the developed countries, Annex 1, and the developing countries of 45%. So all emissions reduction are to be comparable. However, you can have an alternate. You can, in fact, have a small increase in the emissions of developed, uh, con developing countries if, of course, develop the countries, cut it by 96%, and the global reduction would only be 25%. Okay? So, other scenarios are possible. And, you know, but this is, uh, uh, why is the uh, IPCC scenarios not exploring these alternatives? Unfortunately, because these scenarios are all developed uh, in Western acad academia, and uh, there is a very clear, obvious global bias that operates in this. Uh, the same you can do for two degrees warming. There is more flexibility. Let me not get into the details. So the other story is about the peaking of emissions. So of course, I have already explained this. Uh, so you know, if you have a peaking by developed country, if uh, de see the developing developed countries are already reducing their emissions because they have had to do something and uh, some of it is due to their natural change in the structure of their economies for instance the european union's uh, emissions reduction began in uh, the 1970s itself so economic restructuring drives a good part of it as well so when they say peaking of emissions by 2025, basically in the background, they are not committing to increasing their indices, their commitments for emissions reduction. So when you have a global target and they don't reduce their emissions, then what does it mean? It's up to us to have to reduce emissions to meet this target. So it is a burden that is being pushed on to us. So then, of course, they don't talk about uh, who consumed uh, uh, the carbon budget, which was uh, of fifth, four fifths as well. So this is a, a graph which shows very clearly that uh, the uh, dotted lines are the fair share, red for uh, developed countries, blue for uh, developing countries. The thick lines, continuous lines, are the uh, actual emissions. So you see the developed country uh, emissions have been consistently above their fair share. And uh, the developing uh, countries consistently below their fair share. And the only way that there can be any matching is a, if at all a little bit into the future okay and uh, it is just changes a tiny bit and most of this change is also because of china if you leave china out of the story the rest of us nothing changes so these are uh, demonstrations of how alternate emission reduction trajectories are uh, possible. But it just depends that developed countries should take a greater share of the burden. OK? So what about this story of uh, uh, tripling global capacity? Now, you know, e every school child, well, I am exaggerating a bit. Uh, most uh, people who follow climate and energy policy know that India has a target for 
500 uh, gigawatts of uh, renewable plus uh, hydro by uh, as installed the capacity by 2030. What is the target for the United States? You can try to estimate it, but the United States has not declared a target. In fact, neither has the European Union. Why is it? Because all their uh, broader goals are long term. The net zero tamasha was basically that to divert attention towards the long term goal away from the uh, short term goal, then bringing the short term goal as something that everyone must do. Whereas their uh, commitments don't uh, change. And in renewable energy, they don't have a definite target. Now, the whole point is this uh, renewable tripling capacity of uh, RE capacity being tripled. Is it going to come from new capacity? Is it going to come by only from new demand? Or is it going to come because the fossil fuel infrastructure of the developed countries will be replaced by uh, renewable energy? So if the US does uh, only uh, whatever will come from demand, it will require only 26, it will contribute only 26 gigawatt of this tripling, which is a truly enormous number. You can see the total at the bottom uh, from 3.3, uh, 3,300 gigawatts to 10,000 gigawatts is roughly what you are talking about. And the USA can add to this substantially only if it replaces its fossil fuel infrastructure. And that, of course, they have been no promise. And it is unlikely, given that even if they make it, they will keep it because it is clear that Mr. Trump is on his way back and then all bets are off. Uh, there is the thing about energy efficiency, I won't get into it. Let me, in the last, uh, uh, just a few minutes, uh, wrap up on some other things that uh, happened. Uh, there was, of course, uh, adaptation. Uh, there was the framework of the global goal on adaptation was finally brought up and uh, there were, a decision was agreed upon. Uh, unfortunately, uh, of course, uh, one, one must count as a success the fact that every attempt to mix up mitigation and adaptation, I am sorry to say that even in India, many uh, state governments, several state governments, uh, they uh, have been misled into mixing up adaptation and mitigation. So you see something called uh, an adaptation commission or an adaptation uh, plan, and inside it you find carbon trading, carbon mitigation, all kinds of things. So this occurs at the international level. Uh, this is a consequence of the wrong kind of advisors that we have uh, for various uh, uh, state governments around the country, I must say, because uh, uh, the capacities in state governments are very limited to follow these issues. This does not happen so easily at the national level because, uh, uh, because of better scientific capacity, I think, technical uh, awareness. Uh, so there's a consistent effort to mix up uh, adaptation. And of course, they keep emphasizing what they call maladaptation. Now, the uh, of course, you can say that adaptation uh, measures should not leave uh, populations worse off than uh, they were before. This is uh, reasonable. But when there is no adaptation taking place, to first warn about maladaptation and then talk about uh, what kind of adaptation is really mixing issue. Second thing is, if you look at the definition now in the IPCC, which is very unfortunate, the 
it speaks to the politicization of the IPCC process. Uh, there we find that any mitigation that is inevitable in any adaptation process promptly leads to it being dubbed as maladaptation. So it's part of its definition. So the word maladaptation, and I think there was quite a, a confrontation over this, was kept out. Uh, the, of course, uh, uh, to add insult to injury, developed countries kept insisting that there must be an emphasis on transformational adaptation. Now, that is really, uh, I must say, one of the uh, most subtle insults, uh, I would say. I mean, in the class of adding insult to injury, uh, transformational uh, adaptation is something which is uh, at the peak of this list. So if you look at the IPCC definition, transformational adaptation means adjusting your society and regulation. I, uh, it uses some uh, thing about get, preparing societies and economies to uh, cope with transforming them to cope with the consequences of climate change. Now, this is really ridiculous when it is put on adaptation. So, we are supposed in the global south to transform our societies and economies to cope with climate change, climate change where climate change that we have not even caused the substantial. So, this is uh, somewhat really, I must say, and uh, unfortunately, this is uh, not even something that I believe Western governments are aware of. This is a consequence of Western academia, a consistent campaign, thinking that uh, they will rewrite uh, how uh, developing countries work uh, and function. They will transform developing countries uh, through the agency of uh, climate action. Using that as an excuse, the, this is, uh, I think, a blatant interference. Uh, I am fond of saying that just as colonization in one era uh, marched behind the explorer and colonization in another era marched behind the well-meant, uh, well-meaning uh, white man's uh, concern for the native. Uh, the colonialism marches now under the uh, behind the uh, environmental uh, uh, scientist. I'm sorry to say, and uh, uh, I can elaborate upon this if people are interested because uh, it's a subject on which uh, I have fairly firm opinion. So. Then there were other issues. I think we can take it up in discussion time. On finance, of course, uh, an unfortunate uh, success of the developed countries. The figure is uh, uh, the OECD claim that it is providing 89 billion USD currently has sneaked into the GST decision language. Uh, nobody agrees with it. It will be contested. There is this whole story of Article 21C, but that's for question time or later or whatever. And so uh, this is where we are. So carbon trading collapsed, partly for reasons I think well deserved. Uh, no tears were shed about the collapse of the carbon trading negotiations. There are, of course, also problematic. Uh, aspects of this collapse, but uh, for the moment, a uh, going slow on uh, carbon trading is, I think, the uh, excellent thing for the developing world. So willy-nilly, something good uh, on that front has happened. So what do we look forward to? I think uh, it is going to be, of course, uh, uh, the uh, developed countries will beat the drums about uh, enhancing ambition. 
they are not going to do very much. In fact, you see this whole talk of ambition by developed countries comes from a certain mindset. And you know what is the mindset? The mindset is that the developed countries are doing everything right. Only thing the rest of the world has to do is to follow them and do more of it. Nothing could be farther from the truth. If you look at the inertia in climate action that you see in developed countries, you look at their oscillating between the Trumps and the Obamas and Bidens and Kerrys in whether they will even do climate action or not. So what is there about governance in the developed world that gives us confidence? Whereas all studies, whenever the word governance is mentioned in climate adaptation and mitigation, it is always about developing countries. For the wrong reasons, maybe, but there is something that we are doing right if our cumulative emissions are no more than four and a half to five percent today. Anyway, so uh, there will be pressure on India uh, to up its NDCs. India is, uh, must be very careful. India must realize the strategic importance of India's fair share of the carbon budget. And the Indian polity must realize that development is our priority. That development is not to be put on the back burner in favor of carbon trading, in favor of natural farming, in favor of uh, uh, suffering yield penalties in agriculture, in favor of electric vehicle. No, our first priority has to be development. And here, uh, unfortunately, there is a competitive populism among uh, state governments, which I think is unfortunate. I think we need to return to uh, real clarity on the importance of the adaptation agenda without confusing it with mitigation in the work of state governments and uh, uh, other uh, uh, institutions. At the same time, I don't believe that adaptation is simply an issue which is ultra local. So that adaptation begins at the panchayat level. Of course, you know, yeah, all levels of uh, uh, local government have a role to play in adaptation. But uh, this is like saying the unemployment problem has to be solved at the panchayat level. So saying adaptation begins at the panchayat level is just as uh, useful as saying unemployment can be solved at the level of local self-government. So I think uh, we need to think this through carefully. So these are some of the issues that are on board. So let me uh, stop here. Thank you for your patient uh, listening. Uh, so I will, uh, perhaps I can stop sharing. And uh, I have come to the end of my lecture. I'll stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Jeraman. Uh, there are some questions in the message box. Can you see that? A question from Balakrishnan, Pamela Kumar, Valil, and Anilji. You can take those questions if you can see. Or... Ah, uh, somebody said PPT is not changed. It has changed, no? So that was a whole. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was okay. Uh, for mm -hmm. five years by the burden, well, you know, uh, it was not entirely something that uh, developing countries gave up so easily. So there are a lot of expectations which have been set for uh, the World Bank uh, uh, in how it must uh, deal with the fund, and I think. Uh, there is opportunity for review. So it is not as if it was a walkover. It was uh, not the happiest outcome. Uh, there was a take it or leave it situation. So, uh, so but nevertheless, there will be uh, room to revisit it. And uh, let us see. 
So, so one point I must make in this connection is, you know, it is not, the, it is no longer the case like we thought of Copenhagen or Paris, etc. That every that a conference of parties is some make and make or break affair. It will keep going on. It's a process. It is like say the WTO or whatever it is. The other things we deal with: IMF, World Bank, international financial order, trade, all kinds of things. So similarly, we'll have to learn to do deal with the climate also. Uh, in this fashion. Transition away instead of phase out as demanded by developing countries uh, means the interest of fossil fuel countries is kept up. No, I think uh, that's uh, somewhat not quite uh, reflective of the actual situation. Uh, that's a polite language for saying I think it is incorrect. So basically, Phase out was not what was demanded. What developing countries want is differentiation. And it is not phasing out or phasing in. You stay within a fair share of the carbon budget. We can by all means discuss what that fair share should be. But you have to stay within a fair share of the carbon budget. And so, well, you know, yeah, I cannot be expected to phase out coal. That's impossible. So we are not demanding phase out in that sense. But should the U.S. phase out coal? Yes, but yesterday, not today, because they owe the world a carbon debt that is enormous. So I think this, did we say phase out or did we say uh, phase down or did we say transition? Of course, it is important to find uh, some agreement uh, so that the talks don't collapse. So that part of it is important. But in actual practice, if you're talking about the world that can do or should do or what it needs to do for in an equitable way, the answer is, though there are people who should phase out, there are people who should transition, there are people who can phase down. All three are there. But you have to distinguish which one of these is whose responsibility? And this is what the developed countries very often refer That is the issue. Whether it is practicable to triple the renewable energy, considering the fact that it is not I think it is going to be uh, Amala Kumar's uh, question. I think uh, it is not impossible. Large developing countries will uh, succeed. It is unreasonable to ask China to triple, I think, <laughs> because China already has 1,000 gigawatt plus in stock. Is the world's, uh, the next in line is US, which is 200 or maybe 300 something. So they are hugely ahead. So obviously tripling is not going to be uh, possible for them, maybe, maybe not, we don't know. But for India, tripling is already on the agenda. So uh, for us, this is not so much of an issue. This is not an issue for Brazil, mostly hydro there. The trouble is for a lot of other countries in, say, Africa. See, in order to triple renewable, if you scale renewable, then you need to balance the grid because you can't afford to run entire countries on battery power when there is no sun nor wind. This is a fact. Or not everybody can build a reverse pump hydro storage. So, if, so when that happens, you need gas at least or you need whatever natural fossil fuel you have access to. But the whole thing that developed countries are doing is they are insisting that you uh, upscale to renewable energy, but they are not allowing you to install, um, giving money, allowing you to develop backup fossil fuel power you need. So what is the solution? They say you don't need a grid at all, just have decentralized rooftop solar. So this is condemning vast part of the developing world to uh you know energy poverty uh so will this happen in fact we may fail the target then of course they'll all go around screaming 
the world is in danger, but we will fail the target because again, I repeat, you are trying to squeeze water out of stone. So, so Amala Kumar, I think you have a point, but you know, one has to unpack it uh, uh, a little. Should governments uh, prioritize investment in scientific research, particularly by regions that are impacted, or should developed countries provide funding as a form of credit for scientific research in the general of the well, I think it's a bit of both. Uh, see, it's also a question of capacities. In as it is in India, I think our capacities and research are uh, not bad, but certainly far from adequacy or anything which will give confidence. So, from that point of view, yes, we should invest, but we cannot entirely be. Uh, investment in research, we also need access to technology. Smaller countries, I think countries with less resources are far more dependent on uh, uh, external uh, access to uh, technology from outside. So your question is more pertinent to large developing countries and my answer would be yes, both. Uh, the uh, point is, however, that that does not answer the question of a very large number of uh, smaller developing countries with less resources. And for them, a technology regime without barriers that is concessional is very crucial. So you can't expect them to undertake their own research. They can help with applying it. They may excel in niche areas like Cuba in uh, biotechnology, but uh, the, uh, across the board, if you want a transition, they'll need uh, assessment. Again, how do we develop uh, rapidly uh, uh, without coal e energy? It's going to is not going to be easy. So. If we switch off coal, or if we don't build a new coal, okay, that really means that uh, you will condemn yourself to an a per capita energy consumption, which is well below, uh, you know, whatever is reasonable by way of a development energy threshold. So uh, my colleagues and I, again with Dr. Kanitkar, we have done some uh, estimates and uh, uh, sort of a rough ballpark number uh, by estimated through uh, different kinds of evidence is something like 80 gigajoules. This is a per capita uh, energy, annual energy consumption. Uh, we are nowhere near it. We are somewhere around the 20s or something like that. So, uh, so we, if we don't have coal, then we are simply not going to get there. Okay, and uh, so uh, yeah, our uh, our. Um, uh, per capita energy use is somewhere around the mid 20s. The uh, highly developed countries, high developed countries uh, are something like 235 to 36 uh, gigajoules. Medium level developed countries, which includes China, of course, China itself may be higher. That, of course, is uh, 90 gigajoules. Uh, uh, per capita. So, uh, as a result, uh, you see that uh, uh, we need, uh, yeah, you know, we need uh, energy, we need, uh, and there is no other place where it is going to come to, from if it were not for uh, uh, coal, because otherwise you can increase your import bill. Now, biofuels is a idea. I think we can do biofuels to some extent, but we have to be careful with biofuels that it does not displace or damage food production. So that's a 
not a, a guaranteed uh, road to success uh, hydrogen of course there was a lot of talk outside the negotiation there is nothing but there was a specific on hydrogen that uh, there was a declaration on hydrogen, which I think India signed. So on hydrogen, India has, in fact, uh, specifically with UAE, there are uh, uh, collaborations, etc. So hydrogen is a possibility. A lot of countries, uh, including ours, are looking at the potential of hydrogen. Kerala government is also interested in hydrogen. But a lot of it is experimental. So. You know, we need to be sure we have in hand what it requires to keep daily life going. You cannot have a situation where you do an experiment like Sri Lanka and, you know, you withdraw all what is currently being used in the name of a noble ideal of sustainability and then figure out the consequences. You have to have the alternative in place and able to pick up the slack to substitute properly before you let go of your uh, original uh, basis of sustenance. Now, at least, you know, Sri Lanka is a smaller country, three years of unfortunate crisis for its people. But on the other hand, uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, they have managed to recover. In fact, uh, uh, this year they are posting a recovery led, would you believe it, by agriculture sector recovering. But you can't take a country of 1.4 billion and do this kind of stuff. And there is no other country in the world that can bail out a country of 1.4 billion. So, you know, we therefore that is the sense in which I say yes, uh, coal is essential wherever we can substitute coal, not in the health sector for you not know, decarbonizing our PHC is I, I don't think a developmental priority or even our climate priority. But on the other hand, there are many other sectors where we can develop. Uh, sustainable energy use energy efficiency is very important but coal yes we will need and that uh, is the point so if the trade-off is between 1.5 and 1.7 degrees warming i personally think that we will have to face that question so then uh, I, india's contribution to uh, r d is inadequate are Niti Aayog is the, if Niti Aayog wants credit to say this, they have to take a token and stand in the queue, even I am ahead of them. So the low footprint of Indian innovation outside of the IT sector, especially in manufacturing uh, sector is uh, very well known. We are dependent uh, on uh, innovation coming from elsewhere. In our current uh, mood, uh, our uh, leading industrial houses, uh, they don't invest in innovation. They buy companies which have innovated. No? So I think India's innovation uh, policy needs uh, uh, improvement. Uh, well, people have a lot of hope in the startup sector. I'm not saying uh, a startup sector uh, is not promising. When I was in Kerala uh, in the planning board, I've seen promising uh, ideas. But I think uh, the scale and speed of our efforts in this regard uh, are still not enough especially in the sense of going beyond the experimentation to reaching a point where we can actually deploy. So yes, uh, we have to do a lot more. But I repeat, to me, the mantra is and remains development. Development is the foundation for being able to mitigate. Development is the foundation for being able to adapt. Development is the foundation 
for being able to curtail loss and damage. So uh, all of the and development is also the means eventually to uh, have some degree of self-reliance and uh, not uh, depend on uh, uh, completely on climate finance. So social and economic development is ever more uh, urgent. And I will end with this remark that to me, one of the uh, sorriest, uh, uh, one of the unfortunate images was after COP26, when uh, India also declared a date for net zero, that uh, parliament in one voice uh, wanted a discussion on our roadmap to net zero. We've never had a, a parliament demanding a session on a roadmap to zero hunger, on a roadmap to zero malnutrition, a roadmap to zero or very minute levels of very low levels of infant and maternal mortality. So this is something uh, we need to think about uh, seriously. Kerala does well in this regard with uh, respect to indicators of health. Uh, and so justifiably, they can be proud of it. Uh, but nevertheless, I believe if you see NFHS uh, 5, even the figures for Kerala, I think the level of inadequate nutrition, stunting, wasting, etc are still unacceptably large. So I think there is still effort required on these, uh, even in Kerala. So development to me is the mantra that we really need to emphasize. So I have covered the questions which are in the chat box, moderators, so in your hands. Is there, yeah, is there any live questions uh, you can ask or? I have one question about, uh, you talked about the IPCC report it does not include the alternative scenarios uh, due to bias in academia, right? Particularly the influence by the global north. So how can we address this issue? And do you think this might be uh, easier to influence the academia circle uh, in this regard than to convince uh, heads of nation? No, I think uh, leave uh, heads of nations aside. But at least we must uh, convince ourselves that uh, you know an alternative world is possible. Unfortunately, people take the IPCC like some gospel truth. The IPCC does not do original research. IPCC assesses the literature which is there. See, environmental science is not like physics, chemistry, biology, zoology, or molecular biology. Environmental science inherently is an anthropocentric science. You don't talk of uh, an environmental problem, a greenhouse gas problem in Venus, even though the warming of the Venetian atmosphere is a consequence of the greenhouse effect due to methane. But in, uh, on Earth, we talk about the challenge of climate change because it affects uh, human society and uh, all life around us. So whenever you talk of scenarios, etc., then economics is involved. And when economics and technology is involved, then politics is involved. And these are the scientists themselves may be well-meaning, but as they say, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So the biases are there. So what can we do? I think we must learn to be more critical about this literature. Far too often, I find that in our academia, it is simply uncritical uh, repetition of what is said. So I'll give you a very popular example. and very common and is repeated everywhere. Biodiversity is being lost. Okay. Uh, earlier, we had uh, some X, uh, typically large number of varieties of paddy, all have been lost. Nobody asks where does these numbers come from. How well do we know this? 
uncertainty is not a, is not a denialism uncertainty is the window to opportunity to take action so critical attitude to science unfortunately in my experience uh, uh, in many places when i go to a environmental uh, issue, a meeting on environmental issues nobody has a research question everybody knows what is to be done and that is because i think people simply take an uncritical attitude to the uh, scientific uh, quote unquote scientific literature it is scientific but there are other points of view other uh, uh, ways of perspectives other ways of looking at the problem and we don't explore it it's our fault i think to some extent so i think we really need to invest in independent critical thinking the question should not be for us for your generation let me use my age frankly here at this point for your generation the question cannot be is it environment or development is it climate or development no it is how are we going to deal with the climate problem and still have the development we need that is the issue to be solved and if we take that attitude then a uh, lot of this will fall into place so i think uh, we need an investment in critical thinking as always also you uh, talk about the mix up of uh, adaptation and uh, mitigation especially in a state level so have you noticed any of such uh, incident in kerala any particular example or i have not example i was uh, recently looking at the uh, 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 government order on uh, the adaptation commission it is called the formation and mm -hmm. its responsibility it seems to me it is thoroughly mixed up with mitigation there's carbon trading or carbon officers all kinds of things are listed there uh, it is it should we can call it the climate commission but i believe it is called the adaptation commission if i'm not mistaken so i think this is an unfortunate example and uh, uh, in tamil nadu uh, we have a slightly different problem uh, where adaptation is not there on the agenda at all it seems is all about uh, mitigation carbon credits carbon trading and this this throat this country this amazing desire in civil society and government both sides to have carbon trading in agriculture what on earth makes us think in a country with millions of small farming households that you can have carbon trading in agriculture when even the developed countries don't have carbon trading in agriculture what gives us this idea and this is a classic example throughout the country that the green credits in uh, agriculture everybody is uh, who ha over it our corporates are thrilled with it what gives you the idea we our uh, our uh, our small farmers cannot even manage the commodity market the input market you know Yeah. even that they cannot handle how are they going to cope with a carbon market offsets are otherwise and i i think that there is some uh, you know real uh, sense uh, that we do not have here of uh, you know of uh, a commitment to first uh, dealing with our uh, developmental burden you know Mm -hmm. now i think it's the problem of awareness awareness at all, at all levels uh yeah, yeah. the knowledge uh, the, the deficiency of knowledge <laughs> that is one uh, one fact i think and no it is also a kind of uh, hubris it is not only uh, on the right of the political spectrum we have hubris we have it a little bit on the left also i am afraid that india will show the way to the world are we are 4% accumulative emissions only because we have no development in our country <laughs> that is the problem 
not because we were virtuous and sustainable but because uh, we are underdeveloped so i think uh, this uh, idea somehow that uh, I, I sometimes i'm i'm puzzled this is a question i think for sociological analysis this uh, this willingness to say that uh, in a country of such widespread deprivation the willingness to say that development and productivity and the productive efficiency can take a back seat to environmental concerns they can go together yes i, I accept the argument i belong to that stream myself but somehow that is the willingness to argue that you can set it aside is uh, i find very disturbing so how do you see the uh eco marxism or eco socialism in this aspect like uh, development versus environmentalism we talk about uh, developed countries and their politics but uh, does the the new eco marxism are they also contributing to this like that uh, putting environment uh, over development or environment over people human uh, my short answer is yes but uh... i would say that does not do justice to the uh, more complex arguments they have but i think yes eventually that is the problem and the, the problem is uh, uh, the uh, so so for instance <laughs> i was just uh, uh, looking at the world see when the world economic forum the world bank Uh, the rockefeller foundation all of these people suddenly come together and say productivity is not the issue in agriculture sustainability is the issue then little bit say, you know if you have your political antenna alive you must scratch your head and say is eh? and that how did this happen how did the champions of productivity suddenly do a about turn and become the champions of environment how did it happen so i think is very problematic so i think uh, on the one hand there is the fear of ecological catastrophe and this is one possible explanation fear of ecological catastrophe on one side on the second however that we are not going to bear the burden of it so who will bear the burden the burden has to be borne by uh, those who have not reached development if you are not already developed and you don't develop you don't know what you are missing you know like that a hungry man is the best man to go on a hunger strike you know it doesn't cost any effort for him it is his natural condition so a little bit uh, that attitude uh, uh pervades the uh world and uh, I, I, I this is not uh, all eco marxists are not saying that i would say but uh, somewhere if you open the box and look at everything inside you see that uh, they have a certain romanticism about uh, daily life in the global south for the poor which is completely unjustified and i think uh, that colors their thinking very much maybe not in words but in practice yes so oh, i think we thank can thank you Professor jeram and for uh, this delightful talk and thank you everyone for coming for this uh, talk uh, and uh, all these uh, uh, interesting discussions thank you so i think we can stop here